Well, good morning. It is very good to see everybody here today. I want to echo what Glenn has already said to our visitors. If you are just joining us for the first time today, then please fill out a visitor's card. There's actually going to be two different opportunities as you meet with us today to uh, pass that visitor's card in, and we do hope that you'll take advantage of that. We would only like to contact you to thank you for your attendance today and your participation with us in our worship and to extend to you an invitation to study with us. If you are not yet a Christian, if you do not yet understand what the gospel is, then we would love to sit down and present the good news of salvation to you. Welcome. Have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 17. We are going to notice a verse in Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 5. So the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Faith is a difficult concept, isn't it? Faith is one of those things that's very, very hard to put your finger on sometimes. It doesn't always feel like a very definite or concrete concept, at least as far as how I think most people define faith today. They don't always see faith in action. We think of faith as being something that's in the heart. And so when Jesus' disciples ask for this, increase our faith, if all we think of faith is that it's an emotion or a thought or something buried deep within the soul, that doesn't seem like a question that makes a lot of sense. It doesn't seem like a question that could possibly have a tangible answer or a tangible result to it. Increase our faith. And yet Jesus responds very firmly that faith is something that can be increased. Faith is something that you can have. It is a definite thing. And if you had enough faith, there's really nothing that you couldn't ask God to do that he would not be able to do for you. It comes so naturally to some people, doesn't it? And yet we must fight to keep it. It starts so small, like a mustard seed, so pure. But we must endure many hardships and tests along the way for it to grow to maturity. We all start somewhere in our walk with God. So what I want to do in our lesson this morning is spend a little bit of time considering the challenges to increasing our faith. Maybe you're just at that mustard seed point right now, and your faith is very small, but you have it. It's there. Or maybe your faith has been growing for years and years and years. Well, don't get comfortable with that. Don't stop growing as long as there's breath passing between your lips. Continue to strive for an increase in your faith, a faith that continues to grow as the years go by and does not shrink and does not go backward. So let's go to Mark chapter 9. And I'd like to read a story here in Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. Please follow along with me, if you will, in Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. 14. The scripture says, And when they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. And immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, Jesus, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, What are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him to the ground and he foams at the mouth. He grinds his teeth and he stiffens out. And I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. Now in verse 19, Jesus answered and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus looks at the problem here, the root of the problem is a lack of faith. O oh, unbelieving generation, he says. It's a lack of faith that's going on here. Well, he continues in verse 20. So they brought the boy to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion, and falling to the ground, he began rolling about and foaming at the mouth. So Jesus asked his father, you like how Jesus remains so calm 
Oh, that's a great element of this story, isn't it? Then in the midst of all this chaos and the tumult and, and people gasping and people talking and a boy throwing himself onto the ground and foaming at the mouth. And here's Jesus very calmly investigating, calmly asking a few questions. How long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Now immediately the boy's father cried out and began saying, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. And after crying out and throwing him into a terrible convulsion, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up. And he got up. Pretty impressive story, isn't it? Now, Jesus meets this man who has a son suffering with a cruel demon. Jesus' response is not panic. Jesus' response is to not get excited like everybody else. He stays calm, asks a few questions, and deals with the situation. This incident exemplifies some very practical concerns when it comes to our faith. First, it's very interesting to see the way that Jesus responds to him by exclaiming, if you can, if you can do anything, then help us. And Jesus is saying, if you can, is that how you approach the Almighty? If you can, God, if you can do something, God, I've tried everything else. If you can do something about this problem, God, we tried all the other conventional means of answering our problems. And I guess if that doesn't work, we can give God a try. And I think a lot of people have that attitude, don't they? I've tried everything else. I've talked to every doctor. I've talked to a financial consultant. I've read the self-help books. I've Googled it. And when nothing else seems to help, there's always God, I guess. There's always prayer. We could, we could try prayer. Hey, when you've got nothing to lose, you might as well. And, and we're so shocked when our prayers are not answered. I think James chapter 4 has something to say about that, doesn't it? That the reason why your prayers are not being answered is because you're praying with wrong motives. You're not praying because you believe. You're not praying because you have faith. You're praying because it's a shot in the dark and you might as well give it a try because you have nothing to lose. And Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. It is as if our Lord is shocked by the man's lack of understanding. But we do need to give the man some credit. I want to give him some credit for acknowledging his shortcomings. I love the way he says this. I do believe. Help my unbelief. To me, that is the plea of the man with the, the, with the mustard seed faith. He says, I do believe. There's something there. I, I have the elements of belief. I have the beginning of belief. The starting point. There's something there to work with. But God... I need a lot of help getting the rest of the way. And we find ourselves there, don't we? We want to believe. We, we have a mustard seed in our heart. We, we perhaps believe some of the elements of it. I do believe that there is a God because it makes sense, it's reasonable, it's logical, but that's as far as I've gotten. Getting, getting from point A to point B from I believe there is a God to I believe the, the God of the Bible to I believe the Bible itself, to I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that does take some work. There are some steps that have to happen along the way for you to finally come to know God rather than just know a little bit about God. So give the man some credit. He has some faith, but he acknowledges that he's not there yet. I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. Help me get the rest of the way, God. That's where we find ourselves a lot of the times. That's where we find ourselves. Now, this, of course, is in such stark contrast 
to some of Jesus' enemies, like the Pharisees, who refused to believe in Jesus no matter how much evidence was presented to them. This man wanted to believe. He had a thirst for faith. Do we desire that? Do we desire confidence in God? Do we desire to grow and be more in our faith tomorrow than we were yesterday? So that when I get older, I don't waver in my unbelief, but I grow stronger in my faith. Good question then. Does faith just happen? Because some people are convinced that one is either a believing type of person or they're not. As if faith just comes naturally. Some people just have an easier time believing. Maybe the skeptic will say some people are just more gullible than others. But is that true? Are some people just naturally more believing than others? Of course, the opposite extreme is that some people think that belief is just haphazard. That it just comes randomly at times. That it's like a Sergeant York type of thing where you're kind of like slobbering drunk, stumbling down the road and you get struck by lightning and, and you wake up and you have a revelation from God and you're a born again Christian that night. All right, there's your, there's your old movie reference, right? Sergeant York, Gary Cooper, awesome. But some people think that faith is like that. Faith just kind of like accidentally happens along the way. I don't think it's either one, by the way. Does faith grow from a traumatic experience? Does faith grow from an overwhelming emotional attack? Quite to the contrary, Scripture actually indicates that faith is the result of an intellectual process based on logic and reason. It involves evaluating truth. Let me give you a couple of Scriptures here to consider. Acts chapter 17. We'll look at two verses from Acts chapter 17, by the way. Go to Acts chapter 17 and notice here, verses 1 through 4. Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where it says there was a synagogue of the Jews. Verse 2. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them. And for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. Consider here, I think the skeptic's response might be, well, reasoning from the Scriptures doesn't count. You're not allowed to just reason from the Scriptures. You're not allowed to just use internal evidence to prove that Jesus is the Christ. And yet, interesting little detail here. Interesting little detail that as Paul is reasoning... Yes, he's reasoning from the Scriptures, but I don't think the Scriptures were the only thing he was reasoning about. Because when you look at verse 4, who was convinced by his reasoning? Was it just Jews at the synagogue? Was it just God-fearing, law-abiding, circumcised Jews who were persuaded? According to verse 4, it was a great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women as well. These are Gentiles who are being persuaded. So yes, persuading from the Scriptures is a big part of it. I understand that. But I think within the context, he's persuading them from the Scriptures because that's what this audience needed to hear. I think you could just as easily make the argument that we can persuade from other lines of evidence or other lines of reasoning. If somebody needs to be persuaded by logic and reason, if someone needs to be persuaded by philosophy, if somebody needs to be persuaded because of scientific evidence, of the Bible's validity, or archaeology, or its place in history. The great thing about the Bible is that no matter what battle you present to it, the Bible is armed and ready to play. On the front of archaeology, on the front of science, on the front of its place in history, on the front of philosophy, on the front of its morals and its ethics, the Bible came to play no matter what you present to it. We reason. We persuade. Those are two very, very powerful verses here. Reasoning and persuading. Verse 11 is the same way. 
Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. To them, it wasn't just accepting what Paul and the apostles said. To them, it wasn't just an emotional response. They put to the test of Scripture everything that they were saying. There's an argumentation there. There's logic. There's reason. Chapter 19 and verse 8. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Faith didn't just come naturally to them. They had to be convinced. And when they were persuaded because of the reasonable, logical evidence that was presented... They didn't just have an emotional response to the gospel. I think that's required. I think you have to have an emotional response as you cry out, Abba, Father, to the Father who calls you home. But it was also an intellectual response that they had to the gospel. Not only that, but the innate ability to believe in God is within all of us. In a book called Intellectuals Don't Need God and Other Modern Myths, by the good, good title, good book, very interesting title, Intellectuals Don't Need God and Other Modern Myths by McGrath, the writer said, if we are indeed created in the image of God, is it surprising that we should wish to relate to Him? Might not a human desire for God be grounded in the fact that He brought us into being with an inbuilt capacity to relate to Him? And that's a really good point. Now, the, the skeptic and the unbeliever will say, religion is simply a byproduct of an evolutionary process. I actually just read an article this last week talking about all of the psychological and mental processes that are involved in religion, and that all of these things were necessary in our evolutionary development to survive on planet Earth. Now, from one perspective, the unbeliever can say, well, we're just evolutionarily designed to be religious. That could be his take on it, I suppose. But I think that the religious person, the God-fearing person's response is, but should that surprise us? If we're created in the image of God, and if we were created by God to have an innate natural capacity to relate to Him and desire Him and worship Him, then doesn't it make sense that God would design us in a way to be religious? It all depends on your starting point. It all depends on your perspective. Let's move on to our next point here. I just have a lot of questions, somebody will say. I want to believe, but I just have a lot of questions that need to be answered. I think that's good. I don't have any problem at all with people who have questions, even really, really tough questions, even questions that I don't know an answer for right away and that I have to go home and study for a little while and ponder. It is good for us to ask questions in our development as Christians and believers because it's a sign that we want to investigate and that we want to know and that we want to take things to the next level. It's a sign that we don't just want to accept what the preacher says, no matter how persuasive Alan might be or how, no matter how nice I look in my suit, I don't just want to accept what the preacher says. And I don't just want to accept what my parents told me. But I want to really investigate this. Nobody should take everything they hear as truth without checking it and putting it to the test. Good questions show that we're thinking. And without a doubt, there are some very big questions out there. Admittedly, some concepts in the Bible are difficult to understand. I like that even Peter admits this. Peter the Apostle, 2 Peter 3 and verse 16. Notice what Peter the Apostle himself had to say about what Paul wrote. And again, I, I can understand this because when I read the book of Romans, there's still passages in Romans that leave me scratching my head. Chapter 7 is... I think Romans chapter 7 is one of the toughest chapters in the whole Bible. Honestly, chapter 9 is right up there as well. So I appreciate here when Peter says in 2 Peter 3 verse 16 of Paul's letters here, that's who he's talking about, as also in all of his letters speaking them of these things in which are some things hard to understand. You have an admission from the Apostle Peter that some of the things that Paul wrote in his letters are hard to understand. 
So each of us needs to ask those tough questions. We need to ask those tough questions. We should not be satisfied with lazy answers. But we need to dig in deep. Now, understand here, some of our questions might not be answered for a while. Some of our questions can only be answered as we grow up and mature. I, I truly do believe that until you've gone through the process of raising children yourself, there are just some things about God that are always going to be tough to understand. And, and for those who have raised kids or are in the process of raising kids, I, I hope that you can kind of understand what I'm saying here. But when I had kids, I, I went, ah, I get it now, God. I get it. Oh, <laughs> that's what you were talking about, God. I understand now. There are just some things about raising kids. There's things about marriage, too. There's things about growing up and leaving your parents' house. Some questions will never be answered until you finally grow up. Until you're finally on your own, making your own choices, and having to live with the consequences of them, too. There are just some questions that will never be answered until you grow up. So, we need to not just ask questions, but we need to be patient enough to let those answers come to us in their due time. What we are confronted with is not an inability to answer the hard questions, but an unwillingness on the part of, of believers to accept the answer sometimes. So I want to make a few observations here. I want to make a few observations here. Go to Romans chapter 4, verses 19 through 22. In Romans chapter 4, Beginning in verse 19, it says, And without becoming weak in faith, speaking of Abraham here, without becoming weak in faith, he did not waver in his belief, but he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured of what he had promised, he was able to perform. Therefore also it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Great explanation here of the growth of faith in our lives. As we grow and face those tough questions, it's not the asking of the questions themselves. It's not our skepticism. It's not our doubt. It's not, it's not our intellect. It's not our superiority. In the process of asking those questions, are we actually seeking an answer? I love this about Abraham here because you get to see the life of Abraham summed up in just, just a few verses. Without becoming weak in faith, consider what he was asked to do. He was asked to get up and move away from his home. To leave everything that he had ever known, his language, his customs, his culture, and even his family's religion. Because in the book of Joshua, it does make note of the fact that Abraham's forefathers were idol worshipers. And he had to go to a place that he was unfamiliar with, to a people, to a language, to customs that he knew nothing about. And when he was there, he was promised by God that in his old age he would have a child. And there were some speed bumps along the way that he crafted. And then he was asked to sacrifice that promised child on an altar on the top of a mountain after hiking with that child for several days. Just think of all the things that Abraham was asked to do. And without becoming weak in faith, he didn't waver in his belief, but he grew strong in faith. The great thing about Abraham is, as he got older, and as the challenges to his faith got bigger, his faith actually grew stronger. But do you ever feel like sometimes in your own life it's kind of the converse? It's the opposite of that? That as you're getting older and the challenges get bigger, your faith is getting weaker along the way. That when you were a teenager and you first got baptized, you were really excited about God. You were very, very zealous. You had a lot of energy. And, and, and you knew 100% that there was a God, that His Son was Jesus Christ, and that you were going to heaven. But then you got to college. And you met 20,000 other people on campus who were skeptics. And then you got marriage and things got a little tough along the way. You, you didn't always have the finances that you wished you did. 
You lost a job along the way. Then you had kids and that was a challenge all its own. And then you had empty nest syndrome. Then you had to retire. And you had to wonder, what am I going to do? You faced illness and old age. Do you ever feel like as you get older, the challenges to your faith become bigger? And like Abraham, we need to grow in our strength and our faith. As you ask questions along the way, make sure that you're actually willing to accept the answers that are offered. Make sure that you're actually willing to accept the answers that are offered. One of my pet peeves is when somebody asks me a tough question about the Bible, it's a, a supposed discrepancy, a historical error of some kind, and I do my research, I do things on my side, my end of it, and I present a reasonable, logical answer to the question. And before I've even finished giving my answer, they've already moved on to the next question. They don't even want to listen to the answer. They don't even care. They, they don't even care about how to reconcile the differences in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They don't even care about the differences between the Chronicles and the Kings. They don't even care about that historical anachronism that has an answer. They don't even care about that ethical dilemma in the Old Testament. All they care about is stump the preacher. Ask the question. And before I can even finish the answer, they've already tuned out, flipped to the next page, said, ah, but what about this? Do you care about the answers? Or do you only care about the questions? In a book called Becoming a Contagious Christian, one writer summed it up well. And it's a little bit blunt, so I'm sorry. Some use philosophical sounding objections in an effort to keep the focus off of their ordinary, old-fashioned sin. And so all of these questions end up being no more than smoke screens for people who just don't want to change. The last point I'll make is this. From a book called The Case for Faith by Lee Strobel. If you want to grow roses, you don't buy an acre at the North Pole. You go where roses grow well. If you're going to do faith, you probably don't want to join American Atheists Incorporated. Get around people who you respect for their life, their mind, their character, and their faith. So our last point this morning is if you want to see your faith grow, you've got to go where the faith is. Go where the faith is. Now, that doesn't mean that it's just going to rub off on you overnight. And again, that doesn't mean that you just accept answers from everybody without investigation. But it does mean that you've got to get yourself around other people who have a strong faith. See the way the faith is lived. See it and emulate it. Go where the faith is. Go where roses grow. Ask strong Christians how they keep their, their faith fresh. Start reading materials that are faith-building by design, not faith-crushing. Clarify the object of your faith by specifically focusing on Jesus, who is the object and perfecter of our salvation. And once you've identified your faith in the Son of God, start living it. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32 says, If you abide in my word and know the truth, the truth shall make you free. And that's what we all really want, isn't it? Freedom. Freedom because we obey. Freedom because we believe. Now you have an opportunity at this time to make things right with God. To express your belief in Him and to obey what He has commanded. Summed up very well in Mark 16, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So whatever need you might have, please come forward as we stand and sing.